the poster presentation. This is your chance to take a look at the uh, comments that are written on your back. I'm sure you'll be pleasantly surprised. Um, just as a reminder, uh, the room, Heian Room, is open at 9 o'clock every morning. And many of the organizing committee members, as well as mentors, are present in the morning. So please utilize, utilize that time in the morning for the poster sessions. So please uh, utilize that time from 9 o'clock in the morning every day. Well, let's uh, proceed with the sessions. Now we would like to introduce, invite Professor Oquist for his lecture. Uh, let me introduce the moderator for the session, Dr. Takuji Okamoto, Associate Professor at the University of Tokyo. Dr. Okamoto, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Takuji Okamoto. I'm a historian of science at the uh, University of Tokyo. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Ekvist. Uh, Professor Ekvist is uh, served as the uh, Secretary General of the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences uh, between 2003 and 2010. His specialty is uh, plant physiology, uh, especially the uh, photosynthesis. Um, one of the largest tasks, most important tasks of the uh, uh, Secretary General of the uh, Swedish Academy is uh, to announce the uh, newly selected uh, Nobel laureates and also inform them that uh, they have been awarded uh, the prize. And so Professor Ekvist uh, listened to the uh, first voices after the news from the uh, many Nobel laureates. Now, today, Professor is going to talk about uh, the opportunities that uh, science opens up. So could you start if you're ready? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. Uh, and I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to give a lecture here and be part of the Hope, fifth HOPE meeting. This is my third uh, uh, Hope meeting, uh, and uh, as the president of JSPS said uh, yesterday, I was also here two years ago when we had the earthquake, and in the so in the middle of the uh, report of the projects that the participants had made, this room, this particular room started to shake, and I remember my first. We were all scared, of course, and my first thought was. Will the ceiling hold up? Uh, it hold up. Uh, and one of, of my best, uh, rem of course, we were all shocked. But I was very impressed by the professional handling of the, of the, of the situation by the staff of the HOPE meeting and by the staff of the, this hotel. They took all charge. They ordered us under the tables where we were laying for about 10 minutes. And over there, I was laying with Professor Ernst and Professor Gross, <laughs> early Nobel laureates. And uh, everything worked out. But it was a tragic accident uh, because of the tsunami and all that followed from that. So that was hard on, on Japan. But Japan is recovering slowly from that. So uh, my talk today is about uh, Science. Science opens up for new, uh, for unforeseen opportunities. And the way I'm, I'm, have outlined my talk is first to talk about some unprecedented challenges to mankind that we see today. I will then spend some time talking about the, the nature of scientific research. I will talk about the Nobel Prize and how we work uh, to select our Nobel laureates. And then I will finish by talking about what kind of envi environment do you need in order to, to, to increase the probability for, for scientific breakthroughs worthy of, of, of prizes. Well, you are all young and you are sort of getting into the field of, of, of doing research, so you are the future. And last year I shared a story about the Danish young scientist and his experience. And I would like to start with the same story uh, this year, because his, experiments, uh, his experience 
have two major messages, and those messages basically summarize uh, my, my talk today. And this is a true story, and it occurred on June 6, in 1761. It was a young Danish uh, astronomer and engineer. His name was, was Karsten Niebuhr. And that particular day, he was on board on a Danish warship. The situation wasn't pleasant at all, because the ship was preparing uh, for war, uh, tried to get, the whole crew tried to get the ship ready uh, to, to, to meet the approaching enemy. Everybody on that ship was totally focused on the upcoming battle except for one person, namely the young researcher, Karsten Niebuhr. He had positioned his astronomic instruments to, to document a, a very rare event that occurred at that particular moment, namely that planet Venus was passing in front of the sun. This was big science in those days. And I think it's something very touchy about this scene. Everybody was focusing on the upcoming battle, but one person looked in another direction, and he looked at the Venus Passat. He was totally focused on that. He looked in a different direction, and he saw something that nobody else on the ship saw. I like this scene because uh, it's... Uh, it, em it, em it emphasized the rule of us scientists, namely, like Karsten Niebuhr, to look into new directions. And you can read about this in uh, a book by Torkel Hansen. Uh, the title is Arabia Felix, the Danish Expedition 1761 to 1767. And uh, I recommend you to read that book. Karsten Niebuhr, he also says, uh, and I quote, maybe it is these individuals like Karsten Niebuhr who have had the courage to look in new directions that have made the world survive. And I think the need to look in new directions has probably never in history of us humans been greater than it is today. And why is it so? In our knowledge-based societies, we today emphasize the use of research and innovation for wealth creation. And when we, in this context, talk about growth, we usually think of economic growth. But I think we need to be aware that uh, the, the challenge go well beyond that. It is about the sustainable and healthy future for a growing world population. The global threats that we encounter today, they are enormous, with the global climate issue being, being just one expression of the today increasing and devastating overexploitation of planet Earth. With its global dimensions, it has a magnitude that has never before been experienced by mankind. And today, I think it's fair to say that we do not have the technical or social solutions to these challenges. And the political systems have proven to be unable to deal with the problems in a rational way. At least that's the situation so far. However, science has through history proved its potential to open up for new unforeseen opportunities. And in that way, I think that science gives us hope for the future. And I'm pretty sure that it will be societies, societies that emphasize research for new discoveries, new ideas, and new innovations that will foster the kind of ingenuity or creativity that is necessary to find rational solutions to the global challenges. So societies that will emphasize research and innovation well beyond what we so far have experienced give us hope for the future. 
So my first message here is, like Kasten Niebuhr, you should look in new directions to open up for new opportunities. But Kasten Niebuhr, he was also a little bit sad, and he excused himself, saying that if the working conditions had been better, then the recorded data would have been more accurate. So the next question to ask is, do we give our scientists scientists the optimal working condition so their, their full potential can be expressed. How can we best ex exploit the full potential of scientific research? And I will in my lecture today argue for a science policy that does not only emphasize research from a utilitarian perspective within established paradigm. I will argue for more of the kind of research that question accepted views and perspectives, research that look in new directions, research that has the potential to open up for new unforeseen opportunities, opportunities we need. In short, how to foster more groundbreaking research that may qualify for a future Nobel Prize. And I think this is what we need if our knowledge-based societies shall have a fair chance to successfully deal with present and future global challenges to mankind. So this is my second message for today. Uh, look, when, when you in your career, future career, going for postdocs, look for a good nurturing environment. And a, 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 a really creative research environment. Uh, in order to optimize uh, your research career. So now I want to elaborate on these two major messages. First, uh, a few words about the nature of scientific research. During the 90s, I was Secretary General of the Swedish Natural uh, Natural Research Council, and every year we published a book on the scientific theme. One year the title was, and I it's a free translation, but the title was The Beautiful Tool of Mathematics. This was in 1993. And in this book, mathematics is defined both as a useful tool and a beautiful art. These are definitions which I think very nicely summarizes the dual nature of scientific research. It is a useful tool to solve problems, to focus research efforts towards identified uh, uh, social needs for new knowledge, and with the objective of finding new solutions of technical or social nature. That is what we may call need-motivated or strategic research. Sometimes we even have a particular application in mind, and we may use the the term target, uh, target or applied research. This kind of research is often financed through national programs defined to be of strategic importance. But scientific research as a beautiful art emphasizes its more, and I would say, rebellious nature of independence with individual freedom to challenge and question established views, to look into new pulses into the future, and in that way, open up for the new, and I stress again, unforeseen opportunities. Opportunities that we cannot, cannot be predicted, just as Professor Nayori also exemplified uh, the importance of serendipity in his research. This is the kind of research that must be given the trust and the freedom to explore and question without any other reason than to open up for new knowledge and understanding. To me, this is a cornerstone of democracy, just in the same way as free and indep independent media are. And I'm convinced that no society can over time excel in scientific research without encourage, encouraging this kind of freedom, the freedom of thought, questioning, and expression. We all often name this kind of research blue sky research, curiosity-driven research, or simply basic research. In my talk today, I will use the terms targeted and basic research, 
to, to sort of describe the two, uh, two types of research efforts. In order now to justify the call for more targeted research, one often hears that there is no real difference between basic and targeted research, and therefore it's more profitable to invest in targeted research than in free basic research. And at least in Europe, we have launched the term frontier research. We are using that term to emphasize that both types of research can be of high quality by international standards. And I agree that no sharp line can be, can be or should be drawn between the two types of research, since they are interdependent on each other. And many scientists appreciate to have one foot in, in, in each domain. But I think that it blurs the picture not to recognize that over time, targeted and basic uh, research work with different goals and different time perspectives. And therefore, the two types of research efforts have different needs when it comes to funding and organization of research. However, I would like to emphasize that these two natures of scientific research are complementary to each other, and neither of them uh, can in the long term advance without the other. Let me take a more individual perspective on research. In his paper, uh, Creative in Time and Space, uh, Gunnar Turnquist, who is Professor Emeritus in, economic, in Economical Geography at Lund University, he has noticed that it is the research entrepreneur who with great success leads the need-motivated, targeted or strategic research within established paradigm. While it's the independent pioneer, research pioneer, who demand the freedom to look in new directions with a greater potential to open up for the unexpected. Turntwig says that from a science policy viewpoint, it's much safer to put money on the research entrepreneur than on the research pioneer. And the reason is that the entrepreneur is more visible, attracts a broader social response, and it's easy to measure progress month by month. The work of the pioneers is much more risky, it's full of failures, and the significance of the results obtained may not be judged until a distant, uh, distant future. Therefore, the view is it's much safer to put money on the entrepreneur than on the pioneer. I think it's fair to say that today it is the pioneer, it's the pioneers who suffer while the entrepreneurs in, in research, they flourish. Entrepreneurs and pioneers are of course extreme caricatures of scientists. But I think that Turnquist has a point when he emphasizes that they are complementary as they create the basis for, on one hand, efficiency and productivity, and on the other hand, genuine creativity, which I think is a prerequisite for renewing and development in the long term, this complementarity. Turnquist also argues that the research needs to be elitistic, full of uncertainties and risks. The entrepreneur and the pioneer are both necessary for the progress of scientific research, and in unique cases, the two characters are combined in one and the same individual. Such researches are worth their weight in gold. They are rare, but I think good research leaders need to bring in both categories into their research groups or institutions if one wants to make a real difference and become really successful at the highest level. And I think you as young scientists should reflect on what research personality you are. Now over to uh, a few words about the fact that today we have a very high political interest in research and innovations. And this is true both in developed as well as, as, well as in developing countries. And uh, here you see the, the reasons that I think are, are behind this. 
There is an increasing political expectation that research and innovation will create prosperity and health. And we sometimes uh, call this sort of concept as knowledge-based economies. But there is also an increasing call for evidence-based decisions in different sectors of the society. And here research can provide uh, uh, knowledge for, for, for decision and policy making. I have mentioned the increasing global challenges that demand new solutions, increasing population, over-exploitation, environmental issues, health, and you name it. And then there is also, as a consequence of this, an increasing competition for talented scientists on a global market. And there are consequences out of this. And I think the, the, the consequences is impatience. One wants results early. And the effect of this is that free curiosity-driven basic research that need to work with very long time perspectives. That kind of research is internationally now becoming marginalized when more and more emphasis is put on strategic or targeted research defined by various programs. We have an increasing demand for, for deliverables and that reduces risk taking, more focused on safe and specialized research in order to meet requirements in short to medium terms. And I think the effect of this is that it, renews, it reduces the re renewing or creativity of scientific research when it comes to really open up for the new opportunities. Furthermore, today we have a tremendous international bandwagon effect when thousands of scientists all around the world flock around similar questions defined by very similar research strategies, strategies set at national level. And I think the life science sector is a good example of this. This has resulted in what we would call incremental research, characterized by high competition be between researchers, high productivity, and also relatively high quality of data, but with a relatively short best before date. Most of us do incremental research today because the room for high risk, long term challenge in science with the potential to make real breakthrough in science is or has steadily been shrinking. And I think it's important now to find a, do a, a rebalancing between incremental science with short time perspectives. Uh, and move it towards more challenging, groundbreaking research, which require longer time perspectives. And I think it's really needed in view of societal needs. In other words, our best scientists must be given the trust and resources to take risk and address more demanding questions. That is why we must strengthen the conditions for those who want and have the capacity to pursue basic research of the highest distinction aiming at making real breakthroughs in terms of discoveries and new understanding. We simply need more of Kast and Niebuhr type of scientists looking in new directions. I think the Nobel laureates that you will be listening to during this meeting are eminent examples of scientists who have looked in new directions and therefore opened up for new discoveries, discoveries that were not foreseen and discoveries that they change our way of thinking. Last year, I chaired a study set up by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And the title of the study uh, is Fostering Breakthrough Research, a comparative study. I did this together with Professor Mats Benner, Lund University, he is professor in science policy. And uh, uh, the report is written in English and it can be downloaded from the homepage of the academy, uh, kva.se. This study was motivated by the finding that Swedish research 
older, though performing 15% above world average uh, when it comes to impact uh, as measured by bibliometric method. Sweden is falling behind some European nations like Denmark, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. These three countries, they perform between 35 to 40 percent above world average, which is actually the same level as the United States. So the idea behind this study was to uh, take a 20-year perspective back in time, looking at priority setting at national level, at the governance of universities, and the direction of funding of research. And I was surprised the differences between uh, these nations that we were comparing were much greater than we assumed when we started the work. And there were three, there were many aspects, but there were three main aspects that stood out as characteristic of the more successful nation, and I would say nation with more successful universities when it comes to uh, having international impact. And the three uh, aspects uh, that came out very clear is that in those nations uh, that were successful, more successful, they had better support of individuals with new ideas, and they counterbalanced such an effort uh, to the, the various strategic programs. We saw better career opportunities for young scientists in the more successful countries. And we also saw more focus on international recruitment. These are three very important elements in building uh, strong research environments. What we also saw, that money was not the issue. As a matter of fact, Sweden has more research money per capita than the countries we were comparing with. So what the study clearly showed, it showed how important it is to give good support to individuals with new ideas. And the study emphasized how important it is to allow, to allow and encourage young scientists to pursue their own ideas. The study also emphasizes that research today is an international business and you may, as a scientist, look for the best research opportunities around the world. And as I said, the report is in English, so you can download it from the home webpage of the Academy and, and read it there. So the take-home message uh, so far is, today we undermine the potential for scientific research worldwide as we put more and more emphasis on targeted and strategic research program within established paradigm. And we do so at the expense of curiosity and individually driven basic research with a higher potential to make new discoveries that open up for the unforeseen opportunities. And I think it's important to stress, in setting the science policy, one need to consider the fact that these two types of research work with different goals and time pers perspectives. They are interdependent of each other and neither of them can advance without the other. Today we are worldwide weakening the power of science by supporting targeted research at the expense of basic research. The su successful nations in Europe did not follow that rule. They kept a balance between the two. And I think the fact that we, that we sacrifice uh, the basic research is serious in a time when we really need to sharpen the instrument of scientific research in order to find new ways to successfully deal with a range of global challenges. Now over to Alfred Nobel. Uh, the Nobel Prizes in Science and Medicine are internationally defined as, and I think I'm right when I say it, at the highest benchmark for quality. It's a discovery, it's an invention or an improvement of greatest benefit to mankind. That is the highest quality criterion, I think, that 
has been defined, and it was defined by Alfred Nobel in his will. There is a whole family of Nobel Prizes, and the Nobel, Nobel Prize awarding institutions are, as I mentioned, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. We have the Nobel Prize in Physics and Chemistry. Uh, we also have a prize called Sveriges Riksbanks, that's the Swedish State Bank's prize in memory of Alfred Nobel. This is not a true Nobel pr Prize. We like to call it a memorial prize of Alfred Nobel. Then we have the Nobel Assembly of Karolinska Institute. That's the, they are in charge of the Nobel Prize in Medi Physiology or Medicine. And then it's the Literature Prize, Swedish Academy is responsible for that. And the Peace Prize, that's the Norwegian Nobel Committee. This is what Alfred Nobel's will looked like when he wrote it uh, the year before he died. He wrote it in 1895. And the, this is what it basically states. And it, it defines the a quality measure that I just mentioned, which I think is the, the highest quality dimension you can have. It should go to those who during the preceding year shall have come for the greatest benefit to mankind. We think that it's our peers that set the quality of what, what we are doing, but it's actually the consequences for the society and the importance for the society for mankind that sets the highest quality criterion over time. And in, in physics, it shall go to person who have made the most important discovery or invention. In chemistry, it's the uh, important chemical discovery or improvement. And in medicine, it's the most important discovery within the domain of physiology or medicine. And then uh, I, I stop it there. One thing you should be aware of is that a Nobel Prize is not an award for a lifetime achievement. Uh, it's a discovery, invention, or improvement. And as I said, the quality criterion is it should have come for the greatest benefit of mankind. Then how do we identify uh, the Nobel laureates? Well, first of all, I would say we are really not in the first place going for the Nobel laureates. We are going for groundbreaking discoveries, improvements, and innovation. So what's going on the year around is field reviews, and it's the Nobel committees that are in charge of this. It field reviews with focus on identifying major breakthroughs in terms of discoveries, innovation, and improvements. Then on top of this, we have the nomination process. We ask uh, individuals and organizations defined in the will for nominations. And then we have a matching between the nominations and the field reviews. And you know, all, this is the way we work, actually. Uh, we, in, in, uh, in September every year, we send out the nomination letters uh, asking for, for, for suggestions. The letters come in in February. Then during March to May, we have a very broad consultation with experts within the committee and around the world. Uh, then later in, uh, during the year, June to August, uh, the Nobel committees are writing up their reports, making their suggestions, and then they hand this over to uh, uh, the uh, to the academy, which then is discussing the whole thing, and eventually we have the the announcement uh, in early, early October. And then the Nobel uh, Prize Award Ceremony is, is December 10, which actually is the, uh, the date when Alfred Nobel passed away. Sorry. So a Nobel Prize contribution should have opened new doors in science, and it should have wide consequences, scientific, technical, social. And notice, 
there is no national considerations at all in the, the process. Everything is documented, and the Nomel archives are closed for 50 years before they are open to science historians. And I also want to say that many scientists are worthy, but only a few can be awarded. It is sometimes difficult to identify the K researchers behind a discovery, and such fields may not be awarded at all. Theory is difficult to award, uh, uh, and theory has to wait until experiments catch up. And I think the, the physics prize uh, unbroken symmetry in 2008 is a good example. Professor Nambu was the theory, theoretician, and Professor Kobayashi and Maskawa, they showed that the theory was right. I very often get the, the question, why have the Nobel Prizes become so prestigious? And there is not one answer to this. I think there's a whole range of answers, and I have tried to list them here. It was the first international prize established. Uh, so it has had time to sort of become recognized. I think also we can say that the quality of the prize work uh, uh, is high. And uh, I think this criterion consequences for mankind is a guiding uh, criterion that has worked well. Of course, recognition through the quality of the Nobel laureates that have been awarded is also important for building the, the recognition of the prize. I also think it's the broad spectrum. It's science, including medicine, literature, and peace that is awarded. So the, the prize sort of reaches out broadly in, into the society. Then I think looking 100 years back, you can basically see that the Nobel Prize uh, is at the core of science history. You can write science history uh, based on, on what the Nobel laureates have achieved. The Nobel Foundation have developed a good outreach system uh, to, to, to which you can vi visit and, and read about the prizes, good media coverage, and also the royal glory uh, uh, make the public interest broad. We have the award ceremony and the banquet that is followed by the media. This is the setting in the concert hall every year, December 10, uh, when the prizes are given out to the Nobel laureates. And the Nobel laureates are sitting here in the front. Uh, earlier, Nobel laureates are sitting in the back to bed, together with members of the various Nobel committees. And then over here, you have the royal family. Two examples, Professor Nayori receiving his prize in 2000 and one from the hands of His Majesty the King, and then Professor Kobayashi receiving the prize in 2008. And after the prize ceremony, we have a banquet for about 1,400 people. Uh, and there is also, between the, the dishes that are served, there are also some kind of entertainment, usually. Well, now over to my last point. What is required by a research system? What kind of research policy is required to develop such quality that may merit for a Nobel Prize or other high, highly prestigious prizes around the world? And I mentioned the, the Lasker Prize, the Crawford Prize, the Japan Prize, the Cosmos Prize, the Abel Prize, the Kavli Prize, Field Medal, and there are many other highly esteemed prizes around the world. You should notice now that now, now we, are, we will be talking about major discoveries, inventions, or improvements that give breakthroughs, new solutions that prove to become of benefit to mankind. We are not talking uh, about generally highly productive incremental science that follows the mainstream of research. We are talking about the research that really changed the way we are thinking about things about things. And I have been 
uh, reading the work by a professor of sociology at the University of Wisconsin, Professor Roger Hollingworth. And he has analyzed how major breakthroughs in biomedical science and chemistry are either facilitated or hampered by the organizational context within which they occur. One can of course not say that a particular research organization is needed for major discoveries to occur. Since these scientific breakthroughs, they are actually quite, quite rare events. But I think from his studies, you can still draw conclusions about where major discoveries are most likely to occur and where they are least likely to occur. This is what he lists as the five most important criteria for a creative environment that produces Nobel laureates. You need a scientific diversity. You need a variety of interactive subdisciplines. You need a bunch of highly qualified individuals. They should be at the forefront of using new technologies. You should bring theoreticians and experimentalists together. Scientific diversity. Then you need communication and interaction. You need a dialogue. You need to bring in people with different cognitive perspectives, strong interaction, journal clubs, lunches together, Social interactions are also important. People need to communicate across borders. Leadership issues is not talked about all that much, but it's extremely important. You need leadership capacity. Leaders that have a strategic vision for integrating diverse areas and providing focused research on challenging topics. We need leaders that can secure long-term funding, leaders that can make the right strategic recru recruitments to build the environment, and leaders that have the ability to foster a critical but nurturing environment. Adaptiveness is also important. We, you need ways to, to process new knowledge as it emerges among the different people uh, in, in, in the group and have a dialogue in order to open up for new ideas and then go for, for these new ideas. And finally, organizational flex flexibility. If an organization starts to idle, regroup and go for more important challenging questions. Then he has also listed uh, criteria that hamper major discoveries, and I'm just going through it quickly. Differentiation. He thinks that it's too much fragmentation into disciplines with too sharp boundaries, too much delegation to sub-levels with too narrow perspectives, and recruitment delegated to too low levels. That's an example that he has. Hierarchic authority is killing uh, uh, new ideas. So we need to avoid centralized decision-making about research programs. Bureaucratic coordination is killing things, and I think our universities are getting more and more bureaucratic in their uh, way they are run, so that's not good. And then hyperdiversity. We tend to specialize more and more and dive deeper and deeper, but we also need to uh, talk more across, and I think you can do that during the whole meeting, and I think that can be a good uh, uh, experience for you all. So I'm afraid that many of our universities actually are developing into a direction which hamper the probability of major discoveries to occur. And I think your generation can change this. What Hollingworth also noticed is that major discoveries tend to take place in organizations which are quite small. And he stresses, small and interactive. While large universities, although performing extremely well, in terms of being highly productive and occasionally produce a breakthrough that do not produce major discoveries over and over again as seen during the last hundred years in rather small environments. And one example is the Rockefeller Institute, now the Rockefeller University. What Hollingworth also notices is that during the 20th century, knowledge increasingly has become more complex and as this has occurred, research organizations have tended to differentiate knowledge into more and more 
department, subspecialists, and the like. I mentioned that. And in short, he, he says, and I want you to read through this because I think it's an important message. He says that our research organizations have become increasingly fragmented. Scientists and scholars in large universities occupy very narrow niches. In these niches, the small research, small research themes with very similar background operate with a great deal of synergy, and this leads to a great deal of productivity. But if major discoveries are to occur, it's important that research themes have a great deal of scientific diversity. Major discoveries tend to occur in those settings where there is frequent and intense interaction among investigators from diverse fields of science. Organizations in which knowledge is very fragmented and differentiated into narrow niches are setting where major, major breakthroughs do not occur, even if the organizations are highly productive. I think this is an important summary of the situation today in many universities. Gunnar Turnquist, who I mentioned, has also been looking into this. And uh, what he, in his studies, he says, milieu of creativity therefore ought to be seen as places and institutions that attract human beings who possesses unique competence within different areas. And Professor Noyori also stressed that dimension. He emphasized, Turnquist emphasizes the interactive meeting place, and it focused very much on the individual uh, in the creative, creative process. He points at the role of the home and the school in awakening, awakening, awakening and developing the individual's creativity. And he also emphasizes, and this is important, he emphasizes geographic mobility. That enhances uh, uh, the creativity among individuals. This issue of mobility is a very interesting thing. Uh, because mobility is really a cornerstone in creating your creativity. And Ola Tuvertsson, uh, he wrote a PhD thesis at Lund University in 2006. And he was looking at the mobility of Nobel laureates. And on average, a Nobel laureate has worked in 4.6 environments, universities or institutes, before receiving a Nobel Prize. I think that's interesting to notice. And furthermore, a Nobel laureate has on average had 7.4 other Nobel laureates as colleagues during the whole span of a career. So it looks as if environments are contagious when it comes to, to this. So I'm getting to the end of my talk now, and I want to say that knowledge and interaction, exchange of knowledge and ideas, that seems to be elements for shaping creative environments. Environments that are brave enough to address important, groundbreaking questions, also having a fair chance to make discoveries, inventions, or improvements. They may merit for a Nobel Prize. What I have said in this lecture about creative environments as a very strong reference in what the 2009 Nobel laureate in chemistry, Professor Venkatrama Ramakrishnan, write in his autobiography in a book, Le Prix Nobel. He describes the environment of the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. This environment, research environment, has repeatedly, repeatedly produced Nobel laureates in, in chemistry, physiology, or medicine. I think there are 14 or 15 prizes during the Second World War, after the Second World War. What he, he describes the lunchroom on the fifth floor as a meeting place for new thoughts and ideas in a relaxed, relaxed atmosphere. But he also writes, and I want you to read this, there were two other important lessons I learned at the LMB. I found that almost nobody there was working on routine problems just because they would lead to publishable results. Rather, they were trying to ask the most intriguing questions in their field 
and then developing ways to address them. The other lessons was that even very famous scientists would ask questions at seminars that were often trivial to people in the field. And then Ramakrishnan says, it reinforced in me the feeling that ignorance is not something to be ashamed of and that no question is too stupid to ask if you want to know the answer. His message is really that when you talk to scientists in a different field, you should not try to impress on your colleague with your results or, 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 or what you have done. You should ra rather try to share your ignorance because that's a way to start a dialogue and then some new ideas and thoughts can be following. Alfred Nobel again. So now when you have a look at this picture of Alfred Nobel, and I should say that Alfred Nobel, he was both a pioneer and an entrepreneur in science. He made a large number of discoveries, inventions and improvements. So the Nobel Prizes really carry the character of the man. And when he died in, in 1896, he, had, he was the owner of 355 patents. Quite impressive. So my message to you who are still young and want to do a scientific career, we can just hope that your school and upbringing has not only given you knowledge, but also awakened and developed your own creativity by using your knowledge. In addition, to maximize your scientific career, look for a PhD, or if you are going for a PhD now, plan a postdoc training in a nurturing interactive environment where people are encouraged to engage in high-risk research, not being hindered in their research by having to continuously prove themselves by applying for research grants all the time. Avoid environments where you become a workforce to help your supervisor produce research results that are good enough to merit for an extension of the grant. In such an environment, you may be productive but do not expect to be part of major scientific breakthroughs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Erkvist. Uh, Professor Erkvist talked about the uh, uh, significance of the uh, uh, basic peer research, and also the, uh, he, he elaborated on the uh, uh, type of research that Nobel Prize evaluate, and also the uh, 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 suitable milieu for creative research. So now we can move on to the uh, question and answer session. Uh, does anybody have any question or comment? Please feel free to raise your hand. Yes, please. Hi, thank you. It was a good talk. Um, I was just interested. It, it, you clearly outlined what it is that you believe is important for people to um, consider when they are choosing a laboratory or a group to go to in order to be able to advance their career. I think one of the hard things is, as a young scientist, is actually being able to identify those issues initially. Um, and other than that output such as publications or clearly a Nobel Prize would be one, but how do you, how would you recommend to somebody who's young, who doesn't necessarily understand the environment, to go about choosing such a place? Now that, that is the, the, the question, I think. Uh, to, to, to find ways to optimize your career opportunities. Uh, of course, it's very much up to the individual. Uh, the, the scientific word is also the social word in, in a way. You need to interact with those you, you like to work with 
and, and, and find those individuals around the world who you really want to collaborate with. But I think if you have a, a PhD uh, and want to go for, for, for a postdoc, you should try to find an environment. And I think you can do that by just identify people and, and in that environment and see what they have been up to, what have their contributions been. And, and uh, find an environment where you can join a group and then have a dialogue with a sort of potential supervisor that in that group your supervisor is interested in what you can contribute with and that you can already start to develop your own thinking, your own ideas in this broader context uh, of the group where you are working. Uh, I think that's an ideal situation. And I, I think you should advise, and I have talked to many postdocs that are disappointed because they, they feel that they are end, ending up as a, at a workforce. They have to work 12, 12 hours a day, every day during the week in order to satisfy the supervisor. I think that's the wrong environment. Because that might be a productive environment, but it's not an environment that allow new thoughts come out. Because each good research environment need to recognize that it is the potential of young people to challenge and look in new directions that should be nurtured. I think that's important to, 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 to emphasize. And that's in all fields of research. Because I think the greatest potential for renewal is among young researchers that are sort of on their way up. That's what I can say. I think it's also important that you as young scientists talk to each other and, and try to develop these concepts. I, have a, I remember when one of my daughters wanted to go for a PhD. She, she, was working, uh, she wanted to go into pharmacology. And I, I told her there were many su potential supervisors available. <laughs> and so I told her, Look at the contribution of each of the supervisor. What have they done? And, and how creative and good are they in, in producing new results? And she brought that up with her colleagues that my father told me to, get, to, to, to make a review of the supervisors. <laughs> and I think this was a little bit shocking for the environment because all the potential peers, peers PhD students wanted to have the same supervisor. But I think it's, you can put up requirements on, on the kind of engagement that you want to go into as a PhD student or postdoc. Thank you. Any more questions? OK, so that person with the shirt with borders. Oh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. So when you select the Nobel laureates, is there any consideration difference between in industry or in academia? Because it's kind of difficult to find out the amount of contribution to each researcher in industry. So how can you determine the contributions? Yeah, well, You know, scientists, they may during a certain period stay in science, but then after a certain period, they may want to move away from science, maybe move in, into industry and, and into other sectors of the society. But I think our Nobel committees are doing quite a good jo job in order to sort of retrieve back in some kind of science archeology span to go back and see who did the most critical experiment for, for this field now ready to be awarded? And I think here in Japan, there is a very good example of Professor Tanaka, who at the time he received a Nobel Prize, worked as an engineer in, in a company. And nobody had sort of looked at him in the context of having made such a great discovery that that could merit for a Nobel Prize. So 
I think what the Nobel committees are doing, they look for the individuals wherever they are, going back to the fundamental discoveries, improvement or invention that they contributed with. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, another one. Uh, who was the first? I forgot. So the person with the yellow necktie? No, not necktie. <laughs> I'm sorry. With the jacket, that person, yeah. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, coming from a developing country where we have a lot of social problems, and the government is placing a lot of pressure on young scientists and scientists in general to come up with solutions for the social problems. What advice do you have for us as young scientists from those countries? Well, I have met, met many great promising young scientists and also uh, sort of mature scientists for, for developing countries. I think it's we, we need to, to recognize that in a developing countries, the problems are very often of such an immediate character that you really have to use present knowledge in order to find solutions. But a scientist working in the developing countries trying to find the solution to the national problems is also part of an international network. And uh, in that network, he or she may be able to develop aspects of more, uh, more basic research together with other uh, colleague colleagues around the world and try to find a, a way of working in this sort of sector between the applied to the more curiosity-driven research. I think you need to be open-minded and interactive with uh, the scientific community of the world. And I think in that way, you are not only contributing to solving the present problems, you are also uh, contributing to educating the next generation and bringing in new knowledge into, into the system. So uh, I, I would emphasize the importance of international interactions. Uh, uh. So probably we can just accept uh, two more questions. We are running short of time. So. Those two people, you, yeah, that, and the other one. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very nice and informative lecture. Sir, uh, sir in your slides, you've discussed uh, the researchers, research of two types, the research with a high risk management and the research with a low risk management. How can uh, a new uh, researcher or a researcher can balance uh, his research with a high risk management? Did I get the question right? Uh, how we can uh, find a balance between research and management? Was that what you said? Sir, how can a researcher can balance his research with the research of high risk management? The research over oh, high risk of low, low risk and high risk. Yeah. So how can uh, one balance a research with a high risk pers perspective? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. I, 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 I really don't think that you can, in, in, today in the way research is, is governed and, and funded, it's difficult to do it on your own unless you find a mecenate who is willing to invest in you whatever you are doing. I think you, you, you need to fit into the system. But I think it's important for, for you as young people to think a little bit on what time of, of personality you are and what kind of research endeavor you would fit in best. Are you an entrepreneurial type of person? Then I think you should try to develop that aspect of scientific research. If you are a, a more of a, a a stubborn people who want to look into new directions and challenge everything that is uh, sort of present knowledge, then you should uh, find an environment where you can develop your own pioneering ideas. And uh, uh, such env environments are to be found around the world, and you should look for those. Uh, 
environments. But uh, in reality, it's a tricky process, and normally one has to balance between the two and, and find, find a way. But in each environment, try to pursue the kind of research which you, uh, your personality and your interests uh, 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 sort of motivate. I think that's important. That's, not a, that's a reflection. It's not an answer. <laughs> You have to find the answer yourself. Yes, please. Good uh, morning. Thank you, Professor, for that very nice talk. Um, my question is about um, how I agree with you that institutional policies and uh, maybe regulations can affect, or and the environment can affect the creativity as well as um, the output of, of the students. Um, and the, the research team as a general. Um, my question is, do you think that funding can also have an effect on, how, on the creativity and output of, of the university, all the students? Because, for example, uh, in developing country setting, we want to, to do something, but, but funding is a limiting factor or constraint to do that. We can't, we can't avail uh, new technologies, we can't, we can't procure them easily compared to, to other countries which are high. And in terms of collaboration, it's not also easy. We can't just invite um, collaborators. And if we invite them, of course, uh, funding is another, another issue. So, so it's just that uh, how, how, of course, in, in, in the developed country setting, collaboration and um, it's, it's, it cannot, it's not a limiting factor. So that, that's just my, uh, my thinking. Um, yeah, and also the allocation of um, the government in nurturing its students. Just for example, in Singapore, they are allocating 5,000 US dollars per capita or per student. In Japan, 2,500. And in developing countries, about 250 per student. So it has an impact, I think, in the. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, could you make it a little bit shorter? Uh, that's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you are now approaching a very important issue because money rules. It's, it's, uh, I think that's, that's why national science policy is so important that at the national level or maybe across national levels in, uh, one develops a science policy that supports different types of, of, of research uh, with different time perspectives. I think in developing countries, I think it's, it's, it's a good strategy to go for uh, sort of short to medium term perspectives. Uh, uh, but I think uh, on a more global issue, it's important to, to, to preserve the balance between. It's really difficult to say. Uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of impatience in order to get the right knowledge for the politicians that are set to, to make decisions at the national level. And I think uh, we constantly need to convey the message that funding of science need to recognize different aspects of research and, and, and support that. And uh, I think if, if we are aware of that and convey that message repeatedly, uh, I think the knowledge-based society has a bright future. In Singapore, I know that the, the policy is very much to, to develop a strong research port portfolio going all the way from very basic research towards the applied research uh, in different fields, among other fields in the life sciences. And uh, it's interesting how this mixed portfolio in, in Singapore and the strong interaction that you are building there actually is a very good example because I think Sim Singapore is the country in the world that has the most rapid growth of impact, scientific impact, uh, as measured by bibliometric studies. And I think that's very much because you are supporting various type of research uh, in a sort of a research umbrella. And I think that's something for other nations to look into, and I think other nations are looking into that issue. 
Thank you. So now we have to conclude this session, and probably you will have chances to ask a question directly to Professor uh, Ökvist during lunchtime, perhaps. Uh, let's uh, uh, call it uh, uh, day. Uh, no, <laughs> let's finish this session by uh, applauding, applauding, applauding again to <laughs> Professor Ökvist. Thank you, Professor Quist and Dr. Okamoto. Um, now, before breaking.